If you enjoy watching Common Ground online, please consider making a tax-deductible donation at lptv.org. Common Ground is brought to you by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the Vote of the People November 4th, 2008. My name is Michael Muirs, and I have written a book about the words and teachings of Larry Stilde, whose Indian name was Gichi Maingan, which means Big Wolf. He was a teacher, a healer, and a spiritual and cultural advisor for the Red Lake Band of Chippewa Indians from the community of Obashing, or as many people know it better as, Panema. The title of the book is Road to Panema, and the subtitle is The Teachings of Larry Stilde. Well, I've been working for uh, Red Lake as a public relations person for just over 20 years. And about six or seven years ago, I met a fellow by the name of Larry Stilde, who was a cultural and spiritual elder leader from the Red Lake Reservation. He had been gone for many years and then came back, and, and uh, his family were spiritual leaders at Red Lake from Panema, where most of them come from. And he had a philosophy about him that I found unusual in the sense that he wasn't talking to just Indians. He was talking to whites, all the colors of the medicine wheel, red, yellow, black, and white. And uh, that struck me as unusual. I think, you know, that it probably had something to do with the time that he spent in Vietnam. He was in Vietnam during the Vietnam War. He would be now 72 years old if he were still alive. He also went through a period of, I, I'm not speaking out of school here, he was also, I went through a period of alcoholism. Spent some time in uh, Louisiana, married a Louisiana Bell, moved back home and started studying under a former spiritual leader, uh, Tommy, Tom, Tom Stilde, who was a, I believe, an uncle of his. And as Tommy started getting sick, he would ask Larry to take over his cultural spiritual duties. For an example, powwows is where he first started out. He just had this different way. He was a teacher somehow. He was more than just a person to give advice on cultural and spiritual things. He was a teacher and a healer. The first time that I recall noticing something really different about him in his approach to teaching, he had what he called a well briety event, which is a way of approaching uh, alcohol recovery, addictive recovery. And he had this well briety event down at the waterfront here in Bemidji, or as he would say, Bemidji Gamag. <laughs> he also got the mayor at the time to sign a proclamation making that particular day well Briety day in, in Bemidji. And he invited everybody to come. And it, it didn't matter what color, white or red or black or, or brown or yellow, you know, please come to this. And it seemed unusual because I don't recall ever see, having an Indian event in Bemidji before that. I never recall it anyway. So I was, I was attracted to that, and so I started following him around because with my job as public relations person, it was my job to, to attend many of these events that he would be the spiritual and cultural advisor for. And then he, he would say these things that were almost poetic, uh, Chief Seattle-like, you know, if people are familiar with the words of Chief Seattle. And there was a poetry about them. He had a way of forming an argument that built up and also the way he chose his words unlike me who has a tendency to be a little chatty he would get his point across in just a couple of sentences it was really impressive i can think of one time we were out at the panema roundhouse and we've been doing a youth camps for cultural and language out there and it's way in the backwoods of panema at a very special sacred place after this thing was over there's 50, 60 rambunctious kids between the ages of all oh, six and 12 or 13. And, uh, and at the end of this thing, he, uh, he started to speak and the kids 
just quieted. It was just amazing. And he lectured the elders there, the older people, the, the, the language people and the elders, and he said, quit teaching these kids that they've lost something. They haven't lost anything. Their culture and their language is contained in the land. I don't know, he just said those kinds of things, that we haven't lost anything. Nobody is coming from across the sea anymore to hurt your children. We need to rediscover who ourselves in order to heal. And he talked about balance in your life, the emotional and mental and spiritual and physical, saying they're integrated, they're all one. And in order to be a successful human being, you have to balance all those aspects of your life. If I claim this property here as my land, if I claim this as my land, it seems to me that I also claim its history. And there's so many people in the city of Bemidji that think that, that uh, history started in Bemidji in 1895. And the people in Minnesota think that history started in 1858. And the United States thinks that history started in 1976 and the pilgrims before them and, and Columbus, good Lord, before them, you know, that, that that's when history began. But there were people here for thousands and thousands of years, and they had a culture, and they had a language, and I might add that the Ojibwe language is probably one of the most complex languages in the world. You can conjugate verbs 64 times, 128 times you can conjugate verbs. It's just incredible, the, the language. Uh, I don't expect to ever learn it, but I try. But at any rate, if we claim this is our land, then we also claim its history, all of its history. And if we claim that history, I think that we also should respect and maybe even um, celebrate the culture of the indigenous peoples of this land. They've lived here. They know what this, what, where, the spirit, where the spirit is of this land. If land is related to nature and nature to God, then they've got something to teach us about this place that we live in, the sacred spots. And they've got things to teach us about the animals and the plants, and, 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 and they do. I mean, there's medicines, these plants, that a lot of the uh, medicine people don't want to share with us. And the, one of the reasons why they don't want to is they're afraid Monsanto's going to come along and put a darn patent on it, you know, or something. So, I don't know, I think they've got a lot, that there's a lot to teach, and, and that's what my approach has been, is, is with the book is that he's talking almost like a psychologist, kind of psychology and spirituality kind of mixed in together. I think it's a really good message that he puts out there. It's not only the, you know, the four aspects of your life that need to be balanced, but he uses the medicine wheel, which is there's four quadrants, and very deep, many, many layers. He used that to teach. <laughs> He turned 70 years old on the 14th of May, 2014. And he died on the 20th, uh, six days later. And then he had another one of his healing lodges scheduled for the 10th of June. Very much looking forward to that, and, uh, but it never happened. One of the most surprising things that happened when I started gathering all my material that I had on Larry, all his words and teachings, is that, I, is that I ran across something that it doesn't surprise me that I did at all, is I asked him at an earlier date, three or four years before he died, when I first started realizing what a great teacher he was, is I asked him, can I write about this? You know, because I, for an example, you don't shoot pictures during spiritual ceremonies with, uh, on reservations with, with Indian people. So I wanted to ask, can I write about this? You know, can I write about your teachings, which many of them are very cultural, some of them spiritual. Can I write about this? And he wrote me back and he said, well, you know, if you think this will help people, go right ahead. And then I sent him three things that I had written uh, about uh, Ojibwe culture. And he wrote back and he said, wow, I, I, I don't, I never read those before. I, I can't quote him exactly, but he was, he said words to the effect that he really liked it and he thanked me for being the messenger of the teachings. So when I found that, I thought, well, hey, I've got, I can do this. <laughs> I've got his permission, you know? And I kind of, kind of felt like I did. I could almost feel it, but, but I, and that's in the forward. <laughs>
One of the biggest problems I found was finding all this information that I had on him. I had emails from him. I had the stories that I'd written about him. I'd just taken notes. Sometimes he'd start talking about the wolf or something uh, uh, when, when, when the wolf hunt started. And he'd start talking about the wolf. And, I, and I'd start writing. And finally, I bought myself a tape recorder because he'd say these far out things. I asked his wife one time, I says, does he talk like this at home? She says, no, it just seems to flow from him when the time comes, when the time is right. He's just a very impressive person. He touched a lot of people, touched many more people than I'd ever imagined. But, but I had to put it together. And one of the other things, probably half the book, is made up of PowerPoint teachings. What Larry did was he took these teachings, and this includes the teachings of the seven grandfathers, which is seven virtues that he would talk about, and each is represented by an animal. And then, of course, balance in all parts of your life. Bringing that all together and then deciding how it ought to work together uh, was a very, not tedious, because I found myself learning. I was, I was feeling bad because he was gone and I wasn't being taught anymore. But as I went through these PowerPoints and all these stories that I'd written about him and, and all the stories that I found about him, and I even found some film that I transcribed, KTCA did. He was in the language revitalization, Ojibwe revitalization that KTCA did out of the Twin Cities Public Television. So I transcribed that as well. All putting that all together took me hours and uh, hundreds of hours, I'm sure. I, I didn't try to document how long, but it took me a year of fairly regular working on it. When the book comes out, if folks would like to like to pick it up and read it, um, it, it, it was done by a local publisher called River Feet Press. He's got a Facebook page. He's also got a web page. And if you just put River Feet Press in your search engine, it'll come up. But it'll also be available on Kindle. It'll also be available from Amazon. And there'll be various uh, bookstores that, uh, that this publisher has got uh, here in, in, uh, in the city of Bemidji and, and all, actually all across northern Minnesota that, that handle his books. I see importance in the teachings that he had, and I see it even more now that he's gone, which is what happens oftentimes is you realize, oh, wow, this guy was really a great teacher, you know, and, and you knew he was a good teacher at the time, but when he's gone, you realize, oh, wow, and I'm hoping that people will get something out of it and make a better world, you know. I mean, you know, little by little, we all do our little part. If you enjoyed this segment of Lakeland Public Television's Common Ground, consider making a contribution at lptv.org.